In section 6.6, .6, we're going to talk about vectors. So here we'll give you a couple examples as to what a vector could be and how to think about them. So in essence, vectors are everywhere. <clears throat> we just don't really see them. Um, it's pretty much like a force acting upon something else or the idea of something going in a direction at a certain force or speed, something like that. So that could be considered a vector. There is vectors that represent light or sunbeam. That's a vector, but that's for maybe a different conversation. So <clears throat> another thing that is important to know about vectors is that they have components. Kind of like a point has components x comma y, right? A point is made up uh, of two other numbers, if you will, two subcomponents. Okay. Uh, example: Suppose someone is pushing a cart at a thirty degree incline. So you can picture maybe you are pushing a buggy, and here is the idea this is 30 degrees and here is the buggy that is being pushed okay so you're going in that direction so however this is measured the action requires an effort of 120 pounds so you are pushing this and it requires 120 pounds of effort to get it up the hill. <clears throat> so what is a vector composed of? Um, a vector has a magnitude and a direction. The magnitude in this example is 120 pounds. So how much effort uh, is required for the cart to be pushed upwards? Uh, can be seen as the magnitude and then in what direction you're going is 30 degrees from the horizontal so the ground um, assuming that it is completely flat uh, like even if you were thinking of this as the unit circle right this is the initial side and then you could see this as a terminal side and thus that would be the direction that it is going in. So this is very important for vectors to know that they have magnitude and direction. Next, we are going to talk about <clears throat> something that's very important in order for us to communicate and understand the rest of the material that has to do with vectors. So there's a very specific naming convention for when we're writing things. And the reason being is that a vector is composed of many things. So in order to not get it confused with a variable, we have to kind of write it in a different way. So vectors are quantities that involve both magnitude and direction. We already talked about that. And so those are vectors, right? Then there are other quantities that are described only by magnitude. So like I was saying, Vectors only have, well, vectors have two components versus other things that have only one component. So scalars are what are described only by magnitude. So I think I left that out. 
Next, we're going to talk about the naming convention. And the reason why is because when we're talking about vectors, they are quantities that have two components, right? They're made of magnitude and direction, which is what we talked about in the previous screen. Um, and there are other things called scalars, which are quantities that are described only by magnitude. It's kind of like saying a variable that is just a number. Okay, so an example, you can say that the temperature in your room is 72 degrees. The temperature has a magnitude of 72 degrees, but it has no direction. So not to get it confused with the previous example that we covered where we said that it was going at an incline of 30 degrees, I believe is what we said. Uh, this is like how much something measures, okay? Uh, scalars are quantities described by magnitude and no direction. Scalars have only a numerical value, right? Another example is how tall you are, right? For example, somebody can be five feet, 10 inches, and that is just a measure. It has no direction, nothing. So it would be just considered a scalar, okay? Kind of like a multiplier or a factor. Now let's graphically define what a vector is. <clears throat> so a vector is known or can be seen as a directed line segment. So it has an initial point and then it has a terminal point. So here P is the um, initial point and Q is the terminal point. So if we were to give this a name, we can say this line segment A goes from P to Q, right? The order matters because if I say P, I know that it starts here and it goes in that direction. For how long? Well, that is the other component of it. So a directed line segment from P to Q is what we have here. P is the initial point, Q is the terminal point. Uh, this line segment can be represented with the following notation. So initial, terminal, and then it has a line on top, uh, a one directional arrow saying from P to Q. So this is what we know as a directed line segment. This is also notation for a vector, right? It could be understood as a vector. We didn't really disclose the direction. We didn't say how much uh, this line goes on for. Uh, but in other words, it, it could be the most basic definition of what a vector is. Next, let's talk about the magnitude of a directed line segment. So how can we measure how far a line goes? Okay. So as you can see, or as, as you can imagine, the line segment can be pointing in any direction. Okay. So this magnitude is how long the line is. If it goes to the left for however many units, then that's how long it goes for. If it goes in the right, uh, upwards, downwards, it doesn't matter. Uh, this is how we are going to denote the magnitude or the length of a segment. So it is in these two bars, right? It's like double absolute value, if you will, <clears throat> but it's not quite that. 
So this is what defines, or this is how we denote the magnitude of a point or a, a line segment. Sorry. So the magnitude of a segment PQ is, in other words, the distance from point P to point Q. Uh, this is all still part of the naming convention, okay? So whenever you're looking at a text or a homework problem in many textbooks, it is going to be represented as a boldface letter. So here what we're telling you is that vectors are directed line segments. So they're one of the same. And like I just said, the vectors are denoted in a bold face or a thicker letter. Okay. So here's where it's important to understand the naming convention. So if we're doing things on paper and I write this for example and I say this is equals to three right all the way up until now in algebra and even pre-calculus we have said you know this is a variable and let me just choose a different letter let's say x we're very used to knowing that x equals a number or an answer but if I tell you that X is equals to this segment from A to B, here's the difference. This is a scalar and this is a vector. They look the same. So that's where the problem is going to come in, right? We need to be able to differentiate between the two. How do we do it? Well, scalar notation is going to remain the same. However, vector notation has to be introduced. So this is going to be a vector. With the arrow on top is going to tell me that these two are the same. So if you see a letter that is bold-faced, that is the same thing as a vector. So vector notation, vector notation, it just doesn't have the arrow on top. But for you and me, when we are writing things by hand, it's really hard to do a bold-faced letter. So this is the notation we are going to use. Okay. Now, let's talk about some relations that we can expect to see between vectors. So, say that we have vectors V and W. So, notice how they are bold-faced. So, if it's being done by a computer uh, or it's text that is given in a textbook, then it's easier for us to differentiate that between bold-faced and regular text. So, here. They both have an initial point and they both point in some direction, right? In case A, V and W are equal because they both have the same magnitude and the same direction. So notice that they don't have to start from the same uh, starting point. They don't have to have the same origin, okay? Uh, vectors V and W could be pointing in different directions, uh, but still have the same magnitude. Vectors V and W could have the same magnitude, but point in different directions. And then vector V and W could be pointing in the same direction, but have different magnitudes. So those are some of the possible relationships 
that we can find between two vectors. So, based on what we know, how can we determine that vector u and vector v are the same? So, <clears throat> first, let's find their magnitude. So the way we find the magnitude of a vector is the distance, right? Is from one point to the other, and we're going to use distance formula for that. So magnitude of vector u is going to be the same thing as the square root of the difference in the x values squared plus the difference in the y values squared. <clears throat> so if we plug that information in, then we have 4 minus negative 1 squared plus 6 minus 2 squared. So square root of 5 squared is going to be 25 and plus 4 squared is 16. Okay. Then we have square root of 41. Okay, perfect. Then we have to find the magnitude of vector v. So we'll do the same operation. So 5 minus 0, all squared. So I'm not going to write that <clears throat> so we don't waste too much space and time. And then 4 minus 0 squared. So 25 plus 16. And this comes out to be square root of 41. Okay, so I'm going to write that on the side. Magnitude of V is equals to square root of 41. So what does this tell me? This that I just found. They both have the same magnitude, meaning that the distance from one point you know if we're looking at u the distance from negative one comma two all the way to four comma six is square root of 41. and if that's <clears throat> kind of hard for you to see then think this is about 6.403 you know units that's what this means except square root of 41 is just a more exact solution, right? Okay, next, because we, we only show that they have the same magnitude, okay? How can we show that they are pointing in the same direction? Uh, the only thing we have to do is find their slope. So let's find the slope of u. And we do that, again, by the difference in y's over the difference in x's. So, 6 minus 2 over 4 minus negative 1. And we get 4 over 5 for u. And then for v, same thing difference in y's over the difference in x's. <clears throat> so 4 minus 0 
divided by 5 over 0. I'm sorry, 4 minus 0 over 5 minus 0. I think I messed that up. So we've shown then that vector u is equals to vector v. They both have the same magnitude and in the same direction. Next, let's talk about scalar multiplication. So a vector can be multiplied by a real number. So a scalar, if you remember from the very beginning, I said it's just a number, it's just a real number. So here's the formal definition. Uh, we say that if k happens to be a real number and v is a vector, then k times v is called scalar multiple of the vector v. It's kind of like um, enlarging a number by some factor. Except now this number you're enlarging has magnitude and direction. So whenever you're looking for <clears throat> the magnitude of this scalar multiplication, you're going to do the following. You find the absolute value of the scalar, and then you multiply that to the magnitude of the vector v, or whichever vector you have. So whenever you're doing scalar multiplication, uh, one or two things is going to happen. Either, so for example, let's say that we have here vector v. Uh, not u, but v. So if vector k is some <clears throat> real number and you're multiplying it to vector v, then what's going to happen is it's going to point in the same direction, right? You're only making it larger. That's if you're multiplying by a number larger than one, uh, but that's not the point here. Uh, the only thing that we're talking about is the sign of the number K, right? If it's positive, then it keeps going in the same direction. If it were negative, then it just flips the direction of that vector V. Right? The new vector is going to change directions if you multiply by a number that's negative. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, So vectors change their, their direction depending on whatever number you multiply them by. Okay, Here are some examples of what I just mentioned here with this scalar multiplication. So, here is vector v, and on the right side, we have 2v, meaning the original vector v now has a length twice as long. It got doubled. Then here we have vector v, it still got multiplied by one half. However, since one half is less than one, it actually made it smaller by a factor of one half. Then you have this product of vector v and a negative number. So you notice how the arrow is now pointing the opposite direction. And it's a little bit longer because 3 over 2 is 1.5. So this is 1.5 the length of vector v. So that's what scalar multiplication is. <clears throat> Next, let's talk about geometrically showing what vectors are and how to put them together. So say that you are given vector u and vector v. Uh, 
and you want to figure out uh, what is the geometrical outcome of this sum. So it's easier if you have numbers because you could just get a number and it doesn't matter if you're pretty good at drawing or not. But this, this makes us exercise our imagination or how good are you visualizing geometric figures. So here's what's going to happen. You're going to want to think or believe that you're going to add those two segments together. Sorry. Then the way this works is that you put the initial point of one vector on the terminal side of the other. So bear with me while I try to do this here. So here is vector u. That one goes first since it goes first in the sum. Then vector v comes afterwards and here's its initial point but it is going to start from the terminal side of u. Now this distance between them, let's see how we can draw this, is going to be essentially from the initial point to here. So this vector in purple is the sum of the two. So my vector in purple up there is known as the resultant vector. So <clears throat> whenever you're adding two vectors, this is what you have to do. You know, just and there's other conventions that talk about vectors in this way. This is the head and this is the tail. So here's the head, here's the tail. You put the head on the tail of the other vector and so on. So this diagonal that you see here is called the resultant. All right, so graphically, this is what's happening. Now let's talk about the difference between two vectors. So what we're saying here is, for example, we want to find the difference between V and U, vector V minus U. We're going to use the approach of seeing it as a sum. So how is that going to be helpful? Uh, the idea is that we rewrite it as a sum and this sum is going to be between vector v and negative of u. Well, if we are to perhaps draw this uh, by thinking of the two starting from the same initial point, then negative u is going to be the vector going in the opposite direction as regular u then we can rewrite this vector up here because we can say where would I end up if I go from the origin and I go in the v direction and then take the negative u direction that's one way to look at it so in other words i would end up up there now this right here is vector v as well if we go by the same principle that we just did here saying i'm at the or or origin and if i go 
negative u and then positive v, where would I end up? Okay, so the resultant of that is this vector here in the diagonal. So v minus u is that vector in the green. Okay, so hopefully that makes some sense. Uh, the big idea here is to think and try to see it this way, where you're doing a sum, but you're turning that vector into a negative sum, which is still a subtraction or a difference. Next, let's talk about unit vectors and oops. We're going to define what unit vectors are. And this comes from the rectangular coordinate system that we know. So X and Y, just as we know them. But now we're going to put some vectors on them that are gonna help us kind of define every other vector. So in the X direction, we have the unit vector I in the y-axis direction, we have the unit vector j. <clears throat> so they are called unit vectors because they have a length of one. So every other vector that we define using i and j are gonna be multiples of it. So And the question is, what is the use of them? And that is the answer. is so that we can write new vectors and just use factors of i and j to redefine or create every other vector. So vectors in the rectangular coordinate system can be represented in terms of vector i and j, like we just mentioned. So for example, there's a point here and it creates a vector from the origin all the way up to point P. So this distance in the horizontal direction, the x-axis, is some kind of multiple of i. So a times i takes me here. And then, how much do I go upwards? Well, it's some multiple of j. So b times j takes me here. Therefore, the vector is going to be ai plus bj. That defines some vector v. Okay, so all the way up until now, it's just been trying to define, trying to introduce the notation to understand this system for vectors. So we are representing vectors in the rectangular coordinates by using the unit vectors i and j. And so like we just showed in the picture, going from 0, 0 all the way up to a, b, can be represented this way, right? You plug in the x coordinate, the y coordinate, and it's a sum of the two components to define a new vector. So, and to not get confused with the negative number here, I'm going to change these little tabs. Okay, I guess something's not happening. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> so the real numbers A and B are considered scalars, right? They're just real numbers. They're multipliers that we're using there. And 
as we said before, A is the horizontal component, B is the vertical component. And in order to find the magnitude of said vector, all you have to do is pretty much use the Pythagorean theorem. It's just not shown in that form, but it is very much the same thing. You take the square root of the horizontal component plus the vertical component each squared and that'll give us the magnitude of that vector or however long that vector is okay now let's do an example here we are trying to find the magnitude and actually a good picture of uh, this vector v which is negative 3i plus 4j so we go three units in the x direction so well actually negative three units so negative three that way and then one two three four right there so starting from the origin uh, this is vector v <clears throat> how do we find the magnitude of it, well, the magnitude of vector v is equals to the horizontal component squared plus the vertical component squared. So 9 plus 16 square root of 25. And we could have plus or minus 5, but distance uh, can only be positive. Therefore, the magnitude of V is positive 5. Then, <clears throat> what if we have a vector that doesn't start at the origin? That's a good question, right? So, when a vector has an initial point somewhere in the x y coordinate system you know on the in the grid anywhere but on the origin defined by x1 y1 and the terminal point is x2 y2 then it's going to be equal to the following vector vector v is then going to be equal to the difference in the horizontal components times i plus the difference in the vertical components times j right so like i said here order matters this x2 comma j2 is the terminal point so it is going to go you going to go first in the subtraction so notice how x2 goes first y2 goes first so it's important because if we do the opposite then we're going to get the vector that is pointing in the opposite direction okay so we would get the direction of the vector wrong next operations with vectors in terms of i and j so what we mean by operations is like addition and subtraction so just like before when we're adding um this is very similar i, I want to say to complex numbers right one of them has a real portion one of them has an imaginary portion if you're adding if you're subtracting you only add the like components with the like component. So if you're doing, for example, vector v plus vector w, well, you add the horizontal components and then you attach the i, which tells me that that's the horizontal component of the vector, plus b plus d or the vertical component of each vector. And then you attach the j to signify that, hey, that's the vertical component of the vector. 
then if you're doing the difference then you're going to do the difference of the horizontal components plus the difference of the vertical components so not too bad adding and subtracting as long as we follow those rules of just combining the components that belong with each other then we should be good let's do an example and <clears throat> add the two vectors together so i'm going to say i don't know a vector a is the resulting right i'm just going to give it a name it's made up um all right fine before we get too confusing so the sum of those two is this right vertical components and then just attach the i plus the sum of the vertical components right so on the horizontal components we get 11 i and then here in the vertical components we get a negative 5 and that is the sum of those two vectors okay then let's do the difference between the two so vector v minus vector w <clears throat> is going to be 5 minus 6 or the difference in the horizontal components plus the difference in the vertical components And we get the following, so negative one i and this right here becomes 13 j. So that is the difference between those two vectors. And then this is the sum of the two vectors. Now, what about multiplication? So if you're given a vector and you're given a real number then the scalar multiplication of the vector that you're given times the scalar or the number is going to be the following so k times v is the same thing as k times the vertical i'm sorry k times the horizontal component plus k times the vertical component how do we for example find the scalar multiplication of a vector well let's do it uh, six times vector v is going to be six times five of the horizontal component plus six times four of the vertical component so this is 30 i plus 24 j so notice how this number and this number are a multiple of the original right you're only enlarging it by a factor of six then the next example is to multiply by negative three well same thing 
Now what happened here in this? All that we did is multiply by negative 3, but now the vector is pointing the opposite direction and it's three times longer than the original. Okay, so scalar multiplication has that effect. It can change the direction and it can change how long it is. Now, another concept. There is a thing called the zero vector. Now, the zero vector has magnitude zero and the vector zero can be denoted like this as zero with the vector symbol on top of it. It has no direction. Okay. Um, it does have magnitude and it's magnitude zero. Okay. And we can express it in terms of i and j as this. <clears throat> so the zero vector is equals to zero times i plus zero times j. Here are some properties of vectors. Um, we don't have to go over them in depth, uh, but pretty much it just says if you're adding two things uh, and then you add the reverse of it, it's still true, and that is a commutative property. Then if you're adding two vectors plus a third one, then you can change the order in which you add those together and still get the same thing. And that's the associative property. If you're adding a vector plus the zero vector, it is the same thing as the zero vector plus that vector itself, or just the vector without adding the zero vector to it. And that is the additive identity. Okay. Then if you're adding a vector plus the same vector in the opposite direction or the reverse sum of it, it gives you zero. Actually, that is supposed to be the zero vector. Okay, so adding a vector plus another vector will always give you a vector in return. Here in number four, since we're adding opposites of each other or just the opposite direction, it gives us the zero vector. Scalar multiplication, if you have the product between two numbers times a vector, it is the same thing as one of those factors times a vector and then being multiplied to the other factor. It gives you the same output and it's called the associative property. Number two, it says the, the sum of two vectors times a scalar is the same thing as a scalar times each vector and then adding them up. That is the distributive property, right? We know that from regular algebra, but those same properties still apply to vectors and scalars. Then the distributive property um, in a different direction, if you're adding two numbers and you multiply them by a vector, it is the same thing as each number multiplied to the vector and then adding their resulting values. And that is still the distributive property. The number one times a vector is still equals to that vector itself and it is called the multiplicative identity. The number zero times a vector is equals to the zero vector. And that is the multiplication property of zero. So if you multiply any vector by zero, it gives you the zero vector. <clears throat>
then the magnitude of a scalar times a vector is the same thing as the absolute value of that number or the scalar times the magnitude of the vector. Now, we kind of mentioned what a unit vector was when we introduced i and j, but now let's give a better, more in-depth definition of what a unit vector is. So, a unit vector is something that has magnitude 1. And so, for any non-zero vector, the vector uh, v divided by magnitude of the vector is the unit vector with the same direction as v. So this right here is going to give you a vector that then will have magnitude 1 and it's going to be pointing in the same direction as vector v. Okay. Let's do an example, and we're given vector v equals to 5i minus 12j. We want to find its unit vector. So, how do we do this? The first thing that we want to do is find the magnitude of vector v. And we find that by squaring the horizontal component, adding it to the vertical component. So 25 plus 144 gives us 169 and that equals 13. So next we want to do vector v divided by its magnitude. So 5i minus 12j all of it divided by 13. So that gives me 5 over 13 i minus 12 over 13 j. So this new vector that I got, right, is the unit vector that has magnitude 1. So now I have to verify. Now verify that the vector has magnitude 1. So I don't know. Whatever you want to call this, we'll call it vector A, just renaming. So let me find the magnitude of vector A. Well, how do we find the magnitude of anything? It's going to be the horizontal component squared plus the vertical component squared. So that gives me 25 over 144. Made a mistake. This should be a 3. So this squared, that squared. So this is all still under the square root symbol and <clears throat> we get 25 plus 144 is 169. 169 divided by 169 is 1 and the square root of 1 is 1. So therefore this unit vector that we found here, which is the unit vector of v does in fact have magnitude 1.
that um, it is true. We just proved it here by finding its magnitude and getting 1. So it has a length of 1 and it's pointing in the same direction as the original vector v. And I think that's everything for 6.6, .6, which is the vectors.